everyone's super excited. And um, after pretty much you know, not having the gas on, having doors shut for the better half of, I'd say, eight to nine months, it's springtime in Melbourne, you know, it's our time to shine. And, and um, people are really, really eager to go out and, and, and to eat and have a coffee with their mate and, and, and go and have a glass of wine or a margarita at our joint or whatever it is. Um, people are playing catch up football, which is fantastic. So when we were given the green light, we had to be ready. That was, that was one thing we were um, quite aware of. Today on Dirty Linen, we are sticking in my hometown of Melbourne because this is where it is all happening. We are partway through a bit of a long weekend because Tuesday is Cup Day. It's also the first weekend that Melbourne has been out and about after emerging, blinking into the light after our second lockdown. I'm finding this time really exciting, but I'm also finding it kind of nerve wracking. It's like we all have to learn how to socialise again. Businesses have to get up to speed, you know, at 100 miles an hour straight away with all kinds of new things to get their heads around. I'm really concerned about customers and businesses alike getting their heads around all the protocols that are going to keep us COVID safe as we um, just, yeah, move towards our new normal. Today, I am chatting to Hugo Tremaine about these and other topics. Hugo is one of the owners of Little Hop in Fitzroy, a um, taco, craft beer, tequila, Mexican vinyl bar. Um, and I'm re really, really happy to have a chat to you, Hugo. I, I haven't been to Little Hop, I've got to admit, but I've chatted to your co-owner, Anita, quite a bit during the pandemic. And I just really love the vibe of what you guys do. Um, so thank you so much for coming to have a chat to me today. Thanks for having us. How has it been reopening Little Hop? Uh, crazy. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> um, I guess it's been a bit of a time warp the last <clears throat> eight or nine months, really, for, for everyone. Um, around the world and in Australia, especially within hospitality or retail or service industries in particular. Um, I guess it's been a day-by-day -day, um, approach for a lot of us, including myself and Anita and smaller businesses for the last wee while. And then um, it's been all systems go for the last week just to get it uh, up and, and, and back physically running with, um, you know, bums on seats for, for from, from Wednesday. Yeah, it's been, it's been nuts, but... Um, Super positive at the same time. A good, uh, a good crazy, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people through the pandemic and I guess most of the people I spoke to in Hospo kept their businesses going in some form during the pandemic with takeaway. But you guys uh, just just pretty much closed for a number of months, didn't you? We did. We did. We did. I mean, it was um, going back in time. I think it was um, <clears throat> mid to late March for us and uh, pre pre COVID really becoming in, in, in full force. We were we were running a really good late autumn trade up until basically the Tuesday evening before our first lockdown. Um, and then I remember looking at a few figures dipping off and then going, oh, it's just the bad weather. It's the start of winter and stuff, which always happens trend-wise in hospitality for four to six weeks. Um, then by the Thursday and Friday, it was super limited capacity by the Saturday for the, our evening trade. I, there was a, um, my gut was telling me something pretty serious was happening, especially looking universally in, you know, parts of Southeast Asia and Europe who are, and, and, and North America, who were kind of um, probably a bit more ahead of us in terms of, of, of locking things off. Um, by the Sunday night, I worked the Sunday over, by Sunday night, it was kind of, you're all, you're all shut down. So um, I guess we had to make some decisions um, pretty quickly. Um, it was, it, things were changing every 24 hours. Like you had to be, you know, you had to check your updates at, at midnight and your updates in the morning. And I guess we made a decision as a small business, um, if we kind of just clip it now and just shut, you know, turn off the gas for a moment, um, it might put us in a better position to, um, A, look after our staff and B, um, reopen, reopen our bar. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you wouldn't think you'd be reflecting on this in November, uh, that, you know, that this is how long the story would uh, go for. Not for peanuts. I remember having, you know, um, a staff meeting. We had a staff meeting on the, on the Tuesday and there was, little, there, was, there was little information we could really give our staff, which, you know, back in the day when there was two of us, that was fine. Now we're still a small team, but there's, there's, um, that's it's not two people anymore. So trying to communicate with people that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or when we're going to reopen. I mean, back then, optimistically, I thought it might have been a four to six to eight week period. Um, it was really hard to gauge. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought I'd be having this conversation in um, <clears throat> early November. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm not, not too not too sure not too sure what to say. But that wasn't that wasn't um, that wasn't really a viable um, thought. That wasn't part of my thought process anyway. 
Sure. Well, tell me what you did. I mean, I know that you've got a, a bunch of front of house staff that were um, fortunate enough to qualify for JobKeeper. But I know when you, you know, you got the the taco vibes, you got those um, Central American uh, spin to the menu. A lot of your staff are internationals. How, how did they get through it? Yeah, so with the, the front of house staff, I mean, uh, it's a small core team, but there's still six to seven people that are that their, their um, full-time job is, is, is um, working at Little Hop. So we've been, uh, fortunately enough, they've been with us for more than a year. Like a lot of our crew have been with us for a year or two or three years. Um, and uh, a couple of our, key, our core crew are actually from New Zealand. So it was a bit blurry. Initially, uh, I guess if if they were, uh, were to receive the job keeper, um, in terms of our kitchen, uh, all of our kitchen are from um, Central or South America, so from Colombia and, and and from Mexico and Venezuela historically and and, and Nepal, which is a different part of the globe, but. Um, Sadly, they weren't included in um, because of visas and all that sort of stuff. They weren't included in the job keeper, um, and uh, some and some of our guys, some of our crew, they've been with us for three or four years, five years, which is a long time. Um, and they've 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 built it up from a small business into what we are now, which is fantastic. So they've been very loyal and hardworking. So we didn't feel too flash, obviously, about um, you know them being uh, and they, they couldn't go home either just because of the um because of covid so we we kind of juggled a few things and there was some some grants however small they were they were they were um very well received which we got and so i guess we kind of again that decision to turn the gas off and close for a wee while um we offset a um chunks of our grants to our um to our kitchen staff uh, and also tried to, just, I guess, assist them to find some part-time casual work in the time being and tried to give them as much of a guarantee as we uh, honestly could in terms of when we do reopen. <laughs> Again, didn't think it was going to be November. I was thinking maybe, you know, June, July at worst. Um, there will be a job for you um, just so they can put food on the table and pay their rent and, 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 and survive in a very, very um, peculiarly strange time. Peculiar is definitely a good word for this time. Um, so, Hugo, you managed to keep your team together, which I reckon, like, massive pat on the back for that. It's just extraordinary. And now you've reopened it. You've been open for a few days. Tell me about the period leading up to reopening and, and how you, um, I guess, you know, combed your way through the regulations and uh, increased your outdoor capacity, did all those things that you need to do to, to be a, a restaurant in Melbourne at the moment. Yeah, I guess we kind of... Um... That's a good question. We we were so we've always as a takaria we've always done a, a takeaway trade. But however, the takeaway trade <clears throat> is much smaller than having people in you know eating and drinking. Um, there's been a few things we have tried to. I mean, look, we, we've extended our outdoor seating uh, to open on Wednesday. We've basically doubled that. But that's something that we've been working on for five or six years. But we've had um, quite a few difficulties with or they haven't been approved historically, uh, which has been a bit, a little bit of a frustration. But I mean, you know, life goes on. So we had to fast track that really quickly. Um, I, I think there was in the back of our minds late March, I inquired again into, we inquired again into looking at extending our, um, you know, sidewalk trading or curbside trading. We looked into uh, getting a pretty fast track takeaway alcohol license, which were, we were never really in, you know, in, in the basket for being a, uh, a cafe restaurant uh, liquor license with the VCGLR and stuff. Um, so we kind of, as the information was coming through, which there wasn't much coming through, it all came in pretty pretty quickly so i guess we had to optimistically plan for in 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 a best case world or a best case scenario sorry we'll be able to double our outdoor seating because indoors because we're such a small space for for listeners that have come to little hop we're a tiny space um you know having eight people inside and and, and not not many more outside um wasn't really going to work for us so um things there was there was lots of you know chinese whispers uh in terms of what was going to happen post, I guess, the state government um, changing um, legislation and fast-tracking uh, applications in both the CBD and surrounding councils um, in, in, in the light of being a pandemic, no one's going to be inside. Um, a lot of places have closed their doors, most unfortunately. The places that are fortunate enough, uh, the stalwarts that have been there, the institutions that are lucky enough to reopen, um, they need assistance uh, and we need to, they needed to get creative very quickly. So I guess we've just tried to work within those boundaries um, 
as quickly as we could, but at the same time making making some um, you know some scary assumptions that this is what we would be able to do. Is it scary because you were investing in furniture? Is it is it that kind of thing, or what was the scary part? Well, we're kind of we're sort of flying by the seat of our pants because I know there was some um, announcements for things reinvigorating the Melbourne City Council and and the CBD, which I'm I'm sure we all know you being a Melbourneian, it needs some TLC right now, and and then they need to make some changes to get um to get folks in there and 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 celebrating you know what is, inarguably one of the most amazing hospitality lively cities in the world um but within with taking into account current restrictions that will be enforced it's, it, it wasn't going to work out um so we kind of had to fast track things not assuming uh but just guessing hopefully this is going to come into the bag because at the same time a lot of people that um produce their furniture or importing things or making things locally because we try and get things locally made as, as much as we can they're smaller businesses so they've had to lay people off or they've shut the doors for a minute and then um it seems like everyone under the sun has uh, it needs you know more tables more chairs more barriers more umbrellas more furniture more just you know you name it under the sun Every, everything super 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 fast um it would actually be i'd love to see some kind of like crazy time lapse of furniture like around melbourne and what's been happening in the last two weeks when everyone's been scrambling for those umbrellas and tables and heaters and chairs i would just love to see all those chairs like zooming around the city and being put onto pavements and into courtyards and onto decks and there'll be pl- plenty of trucks out there yeah. I mean, we've been fortunate enough to have good relations with um, some smaller producers uh, in Melbourne. A lot of it's sort of bespoke, bespoke furniture. And I guess they've had to just work 24 hours a day uh, and work with their suppliers to get things made super fast, you know, because a lot, a lot of these people, um, there hasn't been any orders for six months. Uh, and then it was just all systems go super fast. And there was, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of businesses in the same boat. Um, so, you know, I think uh, we, we were, we were, we were super lucky. I mean, we kind of, kind of planned ahead and we rolled the dice and, and took a punt and just went, you know what, like we need to, I guess, um, if you're a gambler, roll the dice and just, um, back that this, or that these applications are going to come through, these grants are going to come through, we're going to get extensions. You're going to, all these things are going to happen. Cause if you don't, you're going to miss the eight ball. And then, cause when you do reopen, um, everyone's super excited and, um, after pretty much, you know, not having the gas on, having doors shut for the better half of, I'd say, eight to nine months. It's springtime in Melbourne, you know. It's our time to shine. And, and um, people are really, really eager to go out and, and, and to eat and have a coffee with their mate and, and, and go out and have a glass of wine or a margarita at our joint or whatever it is. Um, people are playing catch-up football, which is fantastic. So when we were given the green light, we had to be ready. That was, that was one thing we were um, quite aware of. Yeah. So... How have you found that? Because I know all that pent up, uh, like urge to socialise. I mean, we're all feeling it, and it's and it's wonderful, and it is so nice to just, um, I guess, feel the city coming back to life, and just you know, f- feel the smiles between people's masks as they catch up again. But how have you found that in terms of uh, managing that beautiful energy and corralling it in a COVID safe way? I think people are pretty respectful now. I think after what what seems like a long a long whack of a, you know, a really really you know, dark and challenging time, just with people wearing masks and having curfews and not being able to leave your house and all that sort of stuff, I think people are pretty pretty conscious and uh, also pre- quite responsible in in terms of what everyone has been through and their own journey, you know, personally over the last. Um, what, what feels like the better half of a year. So I think when they do get to sit down and actually take their mask off and ha- have a drink and a bite to eat, I, I, I believe there's still a, a huge part in the back of their mind of, you know, thank, thank uh, you know, I'm not going to swear, but thank God we're in this position right now, but also it could flip, it could flip in a minute. So everyone just be a little bit wise about it. Um, Cause we don't want it. We don't want this to happen again. And we don't want another, an, another bout of it. Um, and, and, and coming back and pretty pretty severely biting us in the ass. I think we've all been good sports and everyone's been, by and large, um, Melburnians and Australians and people universally have been pretty responsible and it has been very uh, challenging, I guess, um, physically, emotionally, you know, financially, all of the above, I guess. So I think people are super, super lucky and super thankful to be out and about, but at the same time, 
um, let's not count all our chickens. You know, let's um, let's let's work at it responsibly so we can be in this position in in, in two or three weeks' time, and then hopefully later in the year and earlier next year, there's um, we're all on track, as they say in the classics, and there's even uh, more easing of, of restrictions, and 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 we're given more of our life back, I guess. Yeah, well, um, Hugo, I really definitely hope that you're right, and that's 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 the case. So it's, I think, you know, one thing that I've gleaned from chatting to Anita is the community that you've built up around your bar is so strong. One of the things that she was so concerned about when you guys were shut down was, you know, what happened to your regulars that you, you know, people use your bar as that third place, that local lounge room, you know, you you might not have big conversations or perhaps you do, but it's just this place where people feel really comfortable. I'm wondering if um, the fact that you have built that strong sense of community community uh, around your business uh, means that people are really very respectful of the way that you um, set things up as you reopen? Um, well, I guess, yeah, because I, I know um, that was a, definitely a shared concern between a, an editor and myself and, and all of our staff. Um, I think, I think did, she write a, did she write an article with you? Well, she wrote a beautiful article. And it was, it was, cause those people, I mean, um, for our joint, it's been you know, five or six years. So those crew that come in once or twice a week or it's a second office for them, they come in religiously every Sunday to you know, eat their tacos and, and, and to drink some beautiful beers and to have a conversation. Sometimes you want to chat, sometimes you want to leave them alone. Uh, we, we play them, um, we play them, you know, records of our record collection. They become family and they become friends. Um, and they become uh, more than that punter that comes in once every couple of years. They become part of the um, the ilk and and the thread of of, of our little bar. And so you it, it goes be, goes beyond. Geez, I miss that person. It's are they okay? You know. Um, and some of those some some of our regulars they had to jump on a plane asap to go look after their their, their parents in in parts of North America and. You know, some people, uh, some people are living on their own in, in a small little apartment. So their social time is to go into the local bar and just sitting at the bar and just people watching and 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 having that, having that space and having that um, just enjoyment to, to to be out and about. I mean, to to um, for that to be taken, you know, taken away from you so rapidly, um, can be very mentally stressful. You know, um, that that's a real that's that's a real upheaval. So, um you've got to think about those people don't you i mean are they are they okay so did you stay in touch with those regulars 100 percent. yeah yeah we've wow. um we've built quite a uh, astonishingly beautiful little um subculture of extended friends and family at the hop um some people like a lot, a lot of chef buddies a lot of people work in the industry a lot of people that work uh, at universities or different you know they work in it or nine to five jobs and stuff they have become sort of yeah as a, you know part of the furniture at the bar to a point where they are not only regulars but the people that we care for um deeply so uh we've definitely kept in t- kept in touch with all those people independently um and the ones which they're a large chunk that haven't had to relocate back to back back to home overseas um we've kind of been the first place that they've wanted to come back to just to feel back at home and, and just to uh, celebrate some form of a norm i guess uh some form of normality again yeah well, tell me about seeing some of those people back in the bar for the first time. Uh, it's uh, well sensational. I mean, we, we definitely there's definitely a few friendly faces on the Wednesday, or well, uh, both the day and the evening when we kind of reopened. It was um, much beyond anything I could have ever. We we could have projected, I guess, uh, and to see them again. Even a lot of these, a lot of a lot of um, our crew, uh, beautiful people, were, were coming through for takeaway, um, which was so wonderful uh, for them to support us and to see them. But it was still a different form of trade. It was kind of you know lots of have to wear your mask on. It was click and collect, and it was just a little bit different. Um, it was nice to have people sitting at tables and to look after them and, and to see their faces again, um, you know, w- within a space, um, sort of celebrating, celebrating something very simple, which is, which is you know, people, food, um, your friends, your family, your lover, whoever you're with, and, and just actually sitting, sitting down and having that moment with them is, um, well, that's why we work in hospitality, right? Yeah, it's to yeah create that space for people and that's and that, that's it's it bring bringing happiness, you know. Well, it must feel really quite profound for you to be able to offer that to people again. Very, very, very. I think yeah, in a word, thankful. Yeah, very grateful because um, that's something Anita has done forever and a day, and this is what I've also done forever. 
Um, and that's what we, we live and breathe it. So to not have that in our lives and to not know that those really beautiful people are lacking that in their lives or just, just for as short a period as it might be or longer period, if however you want to see it, um, it was um, definitely challenging and, and saddening at the same time. Mm. Anita told me, um, this really moved me when she told me that she was looking after the chickens at, the, at her kids' school. She'd, she'd sometimes go down there and just to feed them, you know, they, they didn't really need feeding, but she'd go down there, grab some greens from the garden and go down to feed them just because she wanted to feed people. She wanted to look after something. She wanted to just display that hospitality. Well, that's, that, that, that's what you do. Like, you know, if, you, if you're in, in it for the hall or that's what you live and you breathe, it's all about looking after people, <laughs> whether it's human beings or, or chickens or, you know, all, the, all, of, our, all of our customers. We, we make doggy tacos for the dogs that come through, you know, and giving them water and giving them a pat and, and saying hello and um, being in that um, position where you are, you're nurturing, you're nurturing people, you know. Um, if you pull that out of someone, if you've done that forever and a day and that's what you do and that's what you live and breathe and that's what you do 24 seven, uh, losing that, um, is I'm, I'm lost for words really. Yeah. It's just a part of yourself. It always has been. It always, and then, and then also as, as a side effect, we weren't really allowed to have dinner parties. You, you couldn't see people. So on your night off, if you're in the hospitality game, often your way of celebrating life is having friends or family over and having a dinner party or having a picnic in the park or you know having sharing those experiences together that's what um that's what makes the both of us uh you know that's what makes our hearts tick i guess so um i can i can see a beautiful metaphor in her going to the school i mean it's irrelevant if the chickens ever needed the feed it's more about that communication and interaction and and and, and being um being in a position of, of giving that love via food. Yeah. You know? So Absolutely. It's it's hard it is hard to put into words. Well, I think you're doing a really great job of putting it into words and and expressing just I think I think it is so central to, to our lives and you know, Melbourne loves to think of itself as as a city that um, expresses itself through hospitality, whether that's, you know, by visiting restaurants or by working in them or as you say, by having an amazing dinner party. And of course it is about the food and it is about the tequila and it is about that great beer, but it really is about uh, being there together and um, all playing our parts and just together weaving that beautiful fabric that is hospitality. Most definitely. And I know we do get an international reputation for it, but I mean, <clears throat> usually by and large, we try and have a big, and this time last year, I think I was in Mexico City for Day of the Dead and I try and get to Mexico every couple of years. So we know travel for us for a wee while, but that's okay. But internationally on a standard, I'm sure we're all well travelled, but I always come home and I think we do a killer, killer, killer job here in Melbourne. Like it's total world class and it's very unique and it's obviously you know, the word for lack of a better word, multicultural and the spirit we do it in is, 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 is superb. It's, it's beyond world class. I'm, I'm just, I'm disgustingly Melbourneian as you can probably, pro probably hear through my statements, but I'm proud to be. And I think a huge part of that is our culture and our, and our subcultures and our, um, our hos hospitality game, you know, I think is, is second to none. Um, so to not have that has, I, I think it's definitely made me realize just wow, how much I've missed today. Yeah. I mean, you've mentioned that some businesses that you've, you've noticed aren't coming back, unfortunately. And of course, you know, pe some people have left and we, we're not going to have those international visitors for, for quite a period, uh, you know, interstate, hopefully sooner. Um, what do you think we've, we've lost permanently? Like, do you think that spirit of Melbourne hospitality that you value so much, you know, is is coming back to life or do you think there's going to be um, a bit of a lag with that or things that things that we won't get back? So that's another really good question. Um, it's so hard to gauge because it is, um, it's early days. <clears throat> but I do know even like well beyond this, even over the last, you know, 12 to 24 months, um, even earlier on the year before um, the first sort of lockdown and, and, and the pandemic hitting Melbourne and Australia, there was so many police signs around, you know, so that was already really quite scary and quite sad back then. Uh, and this, this was pre everyone being locked off for six to eight or nine months. So I think it's, it's going to be challenging for a lot of businesses to, I guess, readapt and redesign and reassign, um, whether they're just entry level um, hospitality venues or whether they're high end venues. I think everyone's just had to um, just reinvent every 45 minutes, which is, which is, you know, it's, 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 it's been tough. And I, I think, it's going to work for some, but not for all. Um, and that doesn't make 
me happy or make you happy. That's just the nature of the beast. I think it's just been a, a, a different turnover this time around. So I think I'd probably be able to, I would, or hopefully we'll be able to give you a better answer to that question in six months time, maybe 12 months time. Um, but yeah, it's, it, 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 it is a, it, it's a, it's a big question and I think it's just time will tell. So Hugo, you're going to jump off this call and go to Little Hop um, for the evening service. Tell us, um, set, set the scene for us. What's it going to be like? <laughs> I'm, I'm running late, but it's all good. I think the crew are there. It's a champagne sketch spring afternoon Sunday here in Melbourne. And uh, Sundays are beautiful because you get the, a lot of really beautiful folk eating and drinking out. So my prediction is it'll be absolutely slamming. Like we'll rock up and it'll be lots of people drinking margaritas and tequilas and beautiful beers. Um, I reckon the crew will be playing some beautiful music off our turntables and the vibe's going to be, um, there'll be lots of friendly faces, um, which I'm looking forward to seeing. And I think the vibe will be super, 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 um, there'll be lots of smiles. Let's just say that. Love it. Hugo, I'll let you go get get in amongst it. Um, thank you so much for setting the scene for us and talking us through the world of Little Hop. It's really beautiful to have a chance to have a chat. Um, thank you for, yeah, getting your restaurant back up and running so quickly. I look forward to seeing you down there and uh, partying hard in a COVID safe way. Thank you so much and have a great time. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. All right. Check you later. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We wanna hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.